That's okay, you told me. Okay, so tonight's talk is, is by Ian Bryce, and it's about the evolution of the universe and from quarks to humans. We usually do this type of cosmology talks every, every couple of years, and Ian is, um, does quite a lot of lecturing for WEA um, for at, at adult learning classes. So I think this will be one of the similar ones that he might have been adapted for, for us off some of the talks that he's given given for others. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us tonight, Ian, to give us a talk on... Uh, physics and the big questions. Thanks, Wayne. Great. Yes, I've got a series of about 10 talks under physics and the big questions, which addresses how science has answered or recast many of the famous questions about the universe. And this one is called evolution of the universe. So let me try, there we are. Okay, this is a bit about my own background. I've been a rocket scientist for most of my career, a university lecturer. So recently I've turned to teaching rocket science to primary kids <laughs> through my ethics classes with access to the school due to my ethics classes. And um, it's actually quite a lot that they can understand, even the eight year olds. I say that's very rewarding. Um, okay. So there, there are eight, the first eight parts of the, of the series, which you can refer to. The slides can all be downloaded if you wish. The link at the end to my Dropbox. And these are some of the questions that the broader series, Physics and the Big Questions, addresses. But for the moment, we're talking about questions about the universe. We're addressing some of those. Um, without going into these in too much detail, because we've got limited time, they're some of the topics in general. So the basic method used by science is of course, as we're all familiar with questions, you ask a question, I have curiosity, you look for evidence, you do analysis on it, and that comes up with answers, which of course are provisional. Um, so when you travel, what do you do? You've got several ways of getting around. You can use the immaterial realm or the material realm. So this talk I use for various other audiences that sometimes have other views other than science, but I think this audience is pretty well scientific. So we can go rapidly over these. When you communicate, you can use immaterial means or material means. And we find that the most successful of these is the scientific method. Advances in medicine, of course, are found through science rather than through any of the other means. So um, there's perhaps a conflict between science and spiritual beliefs, which is what I go to in some of the other talks. So get to get up to the start of the universe. We talk about a bit about where science, science comes, comes from, which includes how some of the famous ideas of scientists are put here, going back a long way to the idea that the Aristarchus' idea that the Earth was around the sun, he was one of the first to explicitly state that, followed by the observational astronomers like Tycho, Tycho Brahe and Galileo, who put numbers to the orbits of the planets, very important advance followed by Isaac Newton, who explained the motion in terms of the laws of gravity and laws of motion. Albert Einstein, who modified those, and Stephen Hawking, who has made things mysterious again, it is often claimed. So Newton clarified things and Einstein confused them. And then Hawking is one of the more recent scientists involved in gravity. There's a bit of a map of science, which is perhaps outside our scope today, as I understand it. So the universe through time, which is our topic today. So the tools with, that are used to study the universe, of course, are telescopes of many kinds to observe things from Earth and from, the, from space near the Earth. Optical telescopes, radio telescopes, infrared, particle accelerators, 
which can reproduce some of the conditions in the early universe, a theoretical framework, and of course, simulations, numerical simulations. So they're the tools which are being used to study the universe now. Now, to look far away, of course, is to see backwards in time. So this um, gives an idea. On the left, here's, here's the Earth. And the further you look into the universe, you're seeing things as they were earlier, all the way back through many um, evolutionary processes in the universe, all the way through to this is the cosmic microwave background on the right. And the further you go, the greater the redshift because the universe has expanded uh, in the meantime very greatly. More detail about that later. So cosmology has revealed the beginning of the universe and also the Big Bang, as we know, when the history of the universe is sometimes shown in a diagram like this. Of course, I'm not a practicing scientist, I'm a science communicator under my present role. So but I've, in my retirement, I've been revisiting a lot of the topics in science and physics, which I find which are quite beneficial. So here we have the Big Bang and the inflation period, followed by the different phases of the universe going from very high energy to very low energy that we see today. These are the typical energies of particles at those uh, conditions. And the earliest times that studied by particle accelerators, for example, the Large Hadron Collider that collides protons together can reproduce many of the conditions that were present very early in the universe. This particular time shows 10 to the minus 10 seconds, which is after the inflation period when things were starting to stabilize, perhaps very short period after the after the inflation period. So the, that produces quarks and gluons and many other elementary particles of very high speed collisions, uh, which can be reproduced in the Large Hadron Collider. And then as the universe expanded and cooled, the particles got slower due to the expansion and um, then less intense accelerators could be used to, re to recreate those particles. So in this, at this time of 10 to the minus four seconds, we can see that the quarks, three quarks are joining together, which of course form protons and neutrons and other particles. And there are still many photons around and electrons are also present. And we'll go through that process at a slower speed. So formation of the elements. So this is a, what do you make of that diagram? Here we can see this is one theory of the universe. And before you all hang up, let me say that, say Bazinga, which is what Sheldon Cooper says when he's carried out a, a stunt or a prank, because this isn't the real formation of the elements, of course. <laughs> it's from some Wacko's theory of the theory of the universe. I put that in just to see if you're paying attention and to look at your expressions. <laughs> Earth, fire, air, and water. Oh, I don't think so. So going back to the Big Bang at 10 to the minus 10 seconds, there was a soup, a primordial soup consisting of mainly of quarks, gluons, electrons, and photons, and other particles as well. All not, collect, not connected to each other due to the very high energy. A bit like a soup there shown, we can see in the bowl of soup, there are the elementary particles and the force particles such as gluons represented by string. It's a, a coils of string in the soup as well. And at 10 minus, 10 to minus five seconds roughly, the plasma cooled enough so the quarks could get together in groups of three to form clusters. And it was very important because that was the quark that the clusters formed primarily protons and neutrons, which were very important to the next phase of development. And then at three minutes, a fair bit 
later, the quarks settled into protons and neutrons and they behaved as individual particles then rather than a, a quark gluon soup or plasma. It's protons and neutrons. Then the universe at that time consisted of three protons shown in pink, three neutrons with electrons also not connected to them. And of course, it's these three particles which eventually became us. And there are also photons, which is light bouncing around and colliding with all the charged particles. And there are many other particles there at the time which can be recreated in the Large Hadron Collider and so forth that we do not see today. And this prevailed for a long time, from about three minutes to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This situation prevailed with little change except that the universe was expanding and cooling. But then, significant changes. At that time, the relative energy of the particles became low enough that they could form, that an electron could combine with a proton and form a stable atom, a hydrogen atom, in fact. So they were the first atoms created at about 380,000 years ago. And due to the expansion of the universe, the photons didn't have enough energy to interact anymore with the particles, so the universe became transparent. And that means the pattern of radiation that was there at the time got frozen in to a large extent. Later developments uh, would leave that largely intact. So if, but since 380,000 years ago, the cosmic microwave background has simply cooled, has gone from visible light all the way down to longer and longer wavelengths all the way down to the microwaves that we see today at about three degrees Kelvin. And this process with the electron and the proton combined, oddly enough, is called recombination. Because when you create a plasma in the laboratory and you let it cool, you get the protons and the electrons recombine to form atoms. But of course, at that stage of the universe, they've never been combined before. So the recombination is a bit of a misnomer, but that's what it's called. So then the gas, so some of the, um, the alpha particles formed, hydro, formed helium nuclei, of course, and the hydrogen and the uh, protons called, caused, called hydrogen atoms. They've got hydrogen atoms and helium atoms, and they initially filled the universe almost uniformly, it's believed. But then gravity pulled it into clumps. And this diagram shows that some parts of the gas are being pulled by gravity into more and more dense clumps. And the parts which were dense got compressed due to the gravity and heated up and began burning. So they were the first stars started shining. That's when the universe, which had become get, getting um, was transparent, had light in it again, sources of light in the form of stars of different kinds, which, which were creating new light in the universe. And in those stars, the heavier nuclei inside the stars, were formed. And I think it was Fred Hoyle who described the process whereby he believed that heavier elements were made in stars, in particular the sun. So it uses the raw material, which was hydrogen, and goes around a, a cycle producing um, nitrogen and carbon and oxygen, the heavier elements. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's they're the main elements that we're made of at the moment. So stellar synthesis of the atoms of life is occurring. And it, it involves an excited state of some nuclei. And without those excited states, this process couldn't occur and the universe would be a rather dead place. So there's been some thought given to the fact that if 
since this universe is habitable, it seems a bit of a coincidence that these excited forms of carbon existed. Okay, now when the stars were burning, some of the heavier elements were blown out of the star to become, to move through interstellar space again. And we can see there the image of the sun and the, the solar wind blowing away clouds of particles out of the sun. So that seeded the universe with heavier elements. And these he heavier elements formed gas and dust. And they drifted around in space for millions of years. They would have cooled down. They would be an atomic rather than plasma until they clumped together again by gravity. And when that occurred, you've got a new generation of stars. And that's how they made new larger stars then. And some of the stars exploded. The larger stars were not stable at the end of their life and they exploded as a supernova radiating into space, heavier elements still, in particular, aluminium, silicon, and fluorine. And these were very active about 300 million years ago. So we can see that stellar evolution, that's evolution in the loose sense, not, um, not natural selection as in Darwin's evolution, uh, guided the formation of stars and eventually life in the universe. So this, cycle is still repeating. There are different generations of stars which can be observed quite readily by astronomers these days. And some branches of the Milky Way show it quite clearly where the clouds, molecular clouds, um, are, get, are forming new stars, which are typically hot blue stars and uh, continuing the process of synthesis of the elements. So here's a bit of stellar evolution. There's a star forming nebula where a cloud of gas, gas collap collapses in gravity, and that can form a sun-like star, which can become a red giant, and that can explode in a supernova or, or similar to become a planetary nebula, which means a cloud of dust. It can also become a more massive star, which becomes a red supergiant, for example, which forms a real supernova, which forms a lot of heavier elements still in a very sudden and violent process, lasting only a few hours and blowing more heavy elements into space. And of course, some of those can go on to become a black hole. So that's some of the elements of stellar evolution. So gold and other heavy, heavy elements have recently, it's, it's believed that their formation has been observed in a kilonova, which is two coalescing neutron stars. Very violent event indeed, depicted here in an artist's view with two neutron stars orbiting each other. They coalesce, very similar to two black holes coalescing, as was first seen in the origin of, of gravitational waves. And then that blows into space very heavy elements like gold, which which does not get created in a continuous stable nuclear process. It tends to end at iron. And there's a cloud of these heavy elements. So possibly the gold that we find on Earth was originally made in a kilonova and recirculated through various stellar evolution processes before it ended up on Earth. And of course, there's a bit of debate now Traditionally, people have become wealthy through mining gold, and these days they claim to become wealthy through mining Bitcoin. So maybe there's some parallel there. But that's beyond me, it's beyond the scope that we have tonight. Okay, now as these nuclei cooled, the heavy elements and the light elements, all the way from hydrogen to helium to carbon to iron to gold and so forth, but when they're blown out of this star in the universe, they combined with electrons to form stable atoms floating around in the galaxies in clouds of dust and gust, gas and dust. And so the origin of all the elements that we have on Earth now that we can detest, detect on Earth and in space has been estimated by the astronomers and astrophysicists 
Those are the periodic table of the elements, and they're color coded according to their origin. So on, on Earth. So, for example, we can see that the um, hydrogen and helium were made in the Big Bang. That some materials were made in small stars, such as the Sun. Some in large stars. Some in supernovae. Some are made by cosmic rays. The ones on Earth are believed to be due to very energetic particles striking the atmosphere and raining down these heavy nuclei onto Earth. Where the, where the cosmic rays come from is another question. And of course, there are some are man-made. These heavier ones still have only been made in particle accelerate, accelerators and haven't been found in nature. Okay, so what is your body made from? Here are the main elements that, some of the main elements that the human body is made from. If you want to remember what your body is made of, you can say chomps. That's a hard thing to say. C-H-O-N-P-S. I want you all to say it now. Chomps. <laughs> Thank you. So C-H-O-N-P-S stands for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. And there are a few others as well, but they're very hard to <laughs> build into the acronym. And we, what do they have in common? They do actually have something in common from a chemical point of view. So hydrogen has one electron. Carbon has um, four electrons in its outer shell. Nitrogen has one electron missing from its outer shell. Oxygen has two electrons missing from its outer shell. Sulfur has two missing. And phosphorus has about three missing. So the point there is that if an atom has an outer shell that's not quite full, that's an unstable situation from a quantum mechanics energy point of view. And therefore that will form a covalent bond where two of them get together and they share some electrons. And life is dominated by covalent bonds, as we'll see shortly. But in the meantime, we can see that these elements were made in stars of different phases, and hence the saying that stars died for us, some people find very illuminating. So on a larger scale, going back to these elements floating around the universe now, gravity pulls the stars into clumps. And this here's an image, a deep space image of the of distant galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope. Look forward to seeing some from the James Webb. Maybe someone can tell me later whether James Webb has found even deeper images than that. But we can see each of these shaped items represents a distant galaxy where the stars have been pulled into a particular pattern by the action of gravity. And it's now believed that about two, about three quarters of that gravity comes from dark energy so it's interesting that apparently when you've got a galaxy, you've got the visible matter, which is, corresponds to the brightness of the galaxy, which is a bright center and outer arms that get less dense. But there's a similar invisible part of it made of dark energy, which is of a similar size, perhaps, which has only been discovered in, in the last few decades, our lifetime. So, so we see that galaxies have their own life in evolution, evolving and merging. Galaxies can, of course, merge together as the Milky Way and Andromeda are due to do in about 8 billion years, I understand. It's a gradual process. There's even some thought that we might survive that process. We might or might not. It's just a matter of luck. Of course, galaxies are mainly empty space, so they could pass through with only a few collisions. But here we have a bit of galactic evolution. It's irregular gal galaxies on the left, they can merge. It's believed that galaxies form a black hole at the center, either often or always. And there can be major mergers that blow other material into space, such as what's called a blazar. Or well, there can be minor mergers, such as the Cepheid uh, gal um, galaxy, which have 
spiral arms like that, in a normal spiral galaxy like that. So the galaxies themselves are evolving in, in a loose sense. So let's get on to solar systems now. Coming back to our swirling clouds of dust and gas, pulled together by gravity. Now the laws of rotation say that if you take any clump of gas, it must have a certain angular momentum, which points in a certain direction. And the laws of motion uh, and collisions between the different parts of the gas suggest that it will form a disk at right angles to that angular momentum vector. So if your angular momentum vector is there, it will form a disk like that. And that's why nearly everything we see in the universe, or most of it, is more or less flat and rotating about that axis. That's why you have planetary disks. Pulled together by gravity, as the collisions dissipate the energy, it can be pulled together to form more and more dense parts at the center. And eventually that forms a, a new star at the center. There's a center, several generations on from the early stars that produced the elements. So here's a picture of the inner disk clumping together into rocky planets. And of course, the outer disk will also clump together. But the heaviest elements, metals and rocks, will generally be in the inner planets. And the outer parts will often be the lighter elements, which form ice and gas giants. It's also colder the further out you are from the sun. So ice and gas can be the constituents of the outer parts. So that's a bit about the formation of solar systems. And of course, the leftover material, some remains in orbit as asteroid belts, and some of it remains there as comets, usually a long way from the star. And some clumps together to form moons. So as our moon formed in that way, my understanding is that the current theories are instead that the a, a collision of a body with the Earth broke off part of it, which became the moon. That's my understanding at the moment. In any case, extra material formed moons one way or another, which is why the solar system has such a variety of different parts of it. And some of the leftover material clumped into rings. So our big planets sometimes have rings which have embedded planet, small planets, embedded moons in some cases, and the rings generally consist of um, relatively small particles. And it's sometimes it's believed that the rings are not a stable structure, that they'll only last a few hundred thousand years, which means that the rings that we see today might have been formed by relatively recent events. And some of the leftover material pumped into asteroids, as I described before, some of which have been visited by spacecraft and some brought back to Earth. And the far out material clumped into Kuiper belt objects. And the Pluto is just one of the hundreds of objects in the Kuiper belt. So as you know, Pluto has been demoted from being a planet to being a planetoid or a Kuiper belt object because it's not in, it doesn't look like it was formed in orbit around the sun. It was perhaps captured in some way. So out in the Kuiper Belt, there are many small icy worlds to explore. And the keys to understanding the origin of the solar system likely lie there because the, those outer objects have been less affected um, over the billions of years since the formation of solar systems, whereas the inner planets have obviously been modified greatly over the billions of years. Oh. Okay, and the so the material in comets can commute between the Kuiper belt in the outside there and the inner inner planets. So that's why comets, uh, by definition, have a elliptical orbit, very elliptical orbit, going a long way from the um, sun to very close to the sun. And I've been reading about 
Halley's comet and the other comets. So Halley noted the that one comet seemed to visit about every 75 years based on historical reports. And but it wasn't always the, the same period, varied by a few years. And it was a great triumph of Newtonian mechanics where they, the scientists of the day showed by calculations, by pencil and paper, can you believe that the previous orbit of Halley's Comet would have passed fairly close to Jupiter or Saturn or both, and that would have perturbed the orbit enough to change the period of return from 76 to 75 years or to 77 years. So that very difficult calculation um, correctly predicted the variation in the period of Halley's Comet, giving very great confirmation to the theory of that's how the planet moved and, and to Newton's mechanics. Okay, now comets, when they're a long way from the sun, they of course get very cold and freeze. When they come close to the sun, they heat up and partly vaporize. They lose a lot of material each time they come near the sun, get a bit smaller. And that gives them a unique character. So they have a, believed to have a icy core with a, sorry, a rocky, an icy core with a rocky crust forming the nucleus. And then the sunlight heats up the outer layer and produces clouds of dust which produces a, a dust tail away from the sun and also an iron tail, which is governed by magnetic fields as well. So there's iron streaming out of the comet and dust streaming out of as well. And I believe that the two tails have, can be visible under ideal conditions. And it's also believed that comets, well, one theory of the origin of water on Earth, given that the early Earth would have been very hot and volcanic, and driven off most of the hydrogen and all of the water. So the theory is that comets delivered water to the Earth after the Earth cooled down in a billion years or so, or, or half a billion years since the formation of the Earth, that comets delivered enough water to the Earth to form the oceans, which is very fortunate for us because water is essential for life, of course. And finally, We've talked about the sun and the planets, the inner planets and the outer planets and the asteroids and the Kuiper belt. And out further, there's the Oort cloud, which is particles which are only weakly bound to the sun gravitationally, the Oort cloud. And of course, and anything outside that is not gravitationally bound to the sun and uh, would be um, galactic objects orbiting around the galaxy separately. So that's what's in the solar system. We've given a bit of a description of that. How do we know? Some of the ways we know what's in the solar system is how it's being explored. I'm going to talk a bit about the New Horizons mission to Pluto, which was big news when I developed this talk. So this Space probe was sent to Pluto a decade or so ago and went past some of the inner planets. And there's some of the figures showing that the distance from Earth at Pluto was 32 astronomical units. That's 32 times the average distance between the Sun and the Earth. And the um, round trip time for light from the probe was about nine hours. That was in 2015 that, that the New Horizons mission reached Pluto. There's a three-dimensional diagram showing us flying past Pluto. So it didn't slow down, didn't go into orbit around Pluto, didn't have any fuel left for that. So it did a flyby at very high speed. So it only had a few hours to get its best photographs. It was launched on the Atlas V. At that time, kerosene LOX engine, plus strap-on boosters, which were solid fuel. And so the first stage here is kerosene and liquid oxygen. And the second stage up here 
is hydrogen and oxygen, cryogenic upper stage, which gives you higher performance at much greater complexity. And it also has a star 48 kick motor up here for propelling it further out of Earth orbit, further away from the Earth towards Pluto. And um, New Horizons has small inbuilt thrusters to complete the, the um, propulsion scenario. S small thrusters to maneuver it on its way to Pluto and past Pluto. So that's how the New Horizons was launched. In about 2015, there's it is being launched. Here it is being prepared for flight. So it's got a big antenna. It's a long way to communicate back to Earth. So it needs a high gain antenna. It has to be able to point that antenna at Earth or in order to get a reasonable bit rate, data rate transmission to Earth. And it's all covered in gold covered capped on film to insulate it, thermal insulation, because the natural temperature of an object out there is very cold and would be very difficult to make it operate at the ambient temperatures out there. So it's got a radioisotope thermal electric generator on the left, whose job it is, it's got a, a hot inner tube due to radioactive decay and it's got cold fins and the temperature difference acts on thermocouples to make electricity, which powers it. It's also got some other radioactive heat sources inside to add to the heating where it's needed. So some of that heat is dissipated inside the body and it's all insulated to try and keep it warm enough. Oh, we, we noted the radioisotope thermoelectric generator there again. And um, why does it have that? Of course, the reason is you can't use solar panels out of Pluto because the solar, the sunlight is so very weak, 32 uh, years away, the inverse square law says sunlight would be about 950 times weaker than near the Earth. And you couldn't collect enough energy in solar panels uh, to keep it warm. So therefore they use radio isotope generators. So they've been used on many deep space probes. Of course, there's a design which is well known by NASA, used many times. And it's um, there's some reservations in using it because some spacecraft rely on a gravity assist back at Earth. And that's a bit dangerous because if, they, if it accidentally re-enters the Earth, it could distribute the radioactive material on Earth. So they're used with reservations these days. And some probes have been made with enormous solar panels instead. Okay, there's some of the instruments, the science payload, stripped of its gold insulation. Some of them have interesting names like Pepsi and Lurie and Ralph and Alice. So some of them are made for pointing at Pluto to do imaging. Uh, and sometimes you have to turn the spacecraft to bring the instrument to bear. That's a description of some of the elements. So the visible and infrared imager, Ralph. There's the ultraviolet imaging spectrometer, that's Alice. There's a radio science experiment that measures the atmospheric composition and temperature. It's a passive radiometer, so it just measures radio emissions from the, the planet. There's the long range reconnaissance imager, a telescope which looks at objects from a long distance away. And um, there's one instrument to measure the solar wind around Pluto and a dust collector, to send the data back to Earth. Quite a lot of elements of instruments there. So here's a picture of Pluto taken by the probe was just so astounding compared to the best photographs we'd had from the Earth environment with Pluto, which showed a blurry, you could hardly call it a disk, a blob with some bright features. So that's uh, one of the first images, detailed images of Pluto. And here's some close-ups. 
So this caused great excitement at the time. Some of you might remember the event. So what was this? Was this a vehicle perhaps driving along a road here? <laughs> probably not. It looks, so what exactly is it? It was thought it was probably a, um, we can see another one on the right where there's perhaps a methane, a solid methane ocean, but the gases at those cold temperatures can flow very quickly, a bit like a liquid. And it's possible that they're slowly floating around like icebergs with, with gaps between them. So that's a very detailed image showing what appear to be mountainous features nearby as well. Now, can we play this video? A flyby. I hope you can see that. It's very dim here, but it is there. This is actual video from the spacecraft as it flew past Pluto. You can see more features there. It's very dim, of course, being a long way from the sun. And you can clearly see the spacecraft moving as the horizon advances towards us. There's a star rising in the background. A bit of colour there in the, the illuminated portion. Lots of icy features there, a bit more colour. And then approaching the ducks horizon again. Okay. Good. Go to see if NASA. See if we can resume the slides. So after Pluto, that wasn't the end of the probe. That was his main mission, was to fly by Pluto and take all those observations. So successful. Then often in these cases, they look for a secondary target, which, which they've often planned in advance, of course. They can adjust the orbit on the way to Pluto with a view to projecting it towards some other object after that. So New Horizons went through several different course corrections after leaving Pluto to visit the object MU69. So it went from that path, modified the trajectory to go to that one. And then, so there's MU69 and uh, the, and um, this, I'm not sure what data it got from there, but it was certainly um, a bonus after its successful mission to Pluto. So that's how we know a bit about the formation of the solar system. Now to come back home, back to the solar system now briefly. So when the Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was hot, molten rock, as I described. When it cooled, it's believed, or one theory is that comets brought ice to Earth, which made oceans and, and uh, water and weather systems. Conditions stabilized. And what science has taught us here is that it's believed that light apparently began when a replicating molecule arose. Now, we don't have a trace of that left now, but it could have been related to RNA, which is capable of reproducing under some circumstances. But there we have a hot pool. Um, 
which is where life, the type of place where life could have originated. And from that more complex forms developed multicellular life. Here are some fish and reptiles from the Cambrian period, some of which have, have they had their soft bodies preserved and to go very rapidly through evolution. Some highlights there, the first mammals, I think were about, I'm not sure, was it 300 million years ago? So that obviously resembles, might be, we might think it was a rat if we saw one today. So it's got a, well, a, a lot of features of current mammals and it's got its internal skeleton and it's warm blooded because it's got fur and lots of teeth and lots of features we can recognize. And eventually the mammals developed and became hominids or human shaped creatures after all the apes and so forth. So there's an artist's depiction of a hominid family cooperating together and gathering and looking after the kids. And eventually they became Homo sapiens, which means intelligent Homo shaped people. So that, that is perhaps our audience at, at uh, Sydney Space Frontier Society tonight. <laughs> and of course, some of those went on, those people went on to become scientists and to invent science. So, so that's a bit about my uh, dramatization of the history of the universe. And we're going to see going to talk a little bit more about what it means at a fundamental level. That's a, bit, a map of physics which I put together a decade or so ago for, as I understand it, from my reading of the literature and, and the popular literature. So it's the fundamental physics, there's elementary particles, there's compound particles, the four forces, and they, they give rise to atoms, they give rise to molecules, that gives rise to all of matter, and hence the other sciences. And the evolution of the universe roughly went from the top of this slide towards the bottom. So the evolution of the universe plotted, followed in a way that pattern of our knowledge, as I understand it. So they're the four basic forces of the universe that makes all this run. We know about gravitation at the lower left, at the top left, there's electromagnetic force that binds nuclei and electrons into atoms and also atoms into molecules. And on the right, we've got the strong nuclear force that binds the nucleus together and the weak radioactive force, which is responsible for radioactive decay. But as far as we as humans are concerned on Earth, the main things we experience are gravity and electromagnetism. In fact, if you're sitting in your chair now, the force between your bottom of the chair is of course electromagnetic. All the matter we know of um, attracts and repels other matter through contact using the electromagnetic force. So that's the most important perhaps. And these four forces account for everything we see happening in the universe at the most fundamental level. And there are apparently no gaps in our knowledge of the universe by our, I mean, scientists in general, not myself, apparently no gaps, which would account for, um, no gaps which would allow for many other, for non-material things to exist, perhaps um, under that theory. So science has a good understanding of the universe and the matter in it, at least in the here and now. So how complete is science's knowledge of how the world works? Let me just look ahead a little. I'll just look at my slides there. See where we're up to. Yes. Oops.
Okay, not far to go. I'll wrap up then. Okay. So let me tell you a very brief little story. Your car won't start. What do you do? You perhaps look under the bonnet, check that it's got oil. If you know a bit about it, you might check that the battery's got juice in it. There's petrol there. There's, the engine seems to be present and not, not missing. You might call the repairman to come and look at it. He has a look at it says, I can't find anything wrong with this car. It's all everything in place. It's got petrol and it's got electricity and it's got a spark. It just won't run. We need the professor from the university. So you call up the professor of physics from Sydney University who comes and looks under your car and he says, ah, oh, yes, there's not actually anything wrong with your car. There's nothing missing. It's just that the laws of physics are suspended in your street today. Now, would you buy that? Would you believe him? Most people say they wouldn't accept that. And what this the significance of this is that it shows that you have great confidence in the laws of physics. You don't believe the laws of physics can be suspended for any reason, at least in the here and now. So there are no gaps in how the world works, apparently. And that can be used to revisit many of the questions that philosophers ask. So we know what makes the cross, crops grow. That's been described in great detail where the universe comes from it can be traced with some reliability all the way back to at least 10 to the minus 32 seconds since the big bang which is a, a short period indeed and the origin of the universe has in fact there are there are hypotheses which study that in some detail that's so it's largely answered the history of the universe where it came from how does it work? It's been mapped out by science. And as new questions arise about the universe, they're largely answered by science. The ultimate fate of the universe, it's not difficult to predict, project the laws of astronomy and physics into the future. So that has also been largely answered by science and we won't be visit, visiting that in this talk. These are topics for an, another talk I have, which is on the shape of the universe on more of detail so the end of the universe um that's that's another topic which we're not visiting today but in any case the so that's a bit that's on that's my talk on the evolution of the universe i hope that's been of some interest and the slides are available in my dropbox if you want to you can write down that tiny url or copy it and download the slides which uh, describe some of the things we've talked about today so thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Um, actually, could you paste the Dropbox link into the chat? So it'll probably be easy for them to actually um, then take it at that point. But anyway, okay. you can do that while you... Uh, yes, I'll do that. Yeah, because in it's going to... real time, yep. Real that in real time, because once it goes into the chat, it's easy for them to take out. So you have to do that. And I see that Scott's asked an interesting question in a minute. Once you've gone able to do that, we can probably go through that question. Mm -hmm. So after you've done that, you can actually see Scott's question, hopefully. Okay, I haven't been reading the chat. No, there hasn't, there has okay. been a Okay, but this is the, okay, so can you see the chat at the moment or do you want me to read it out? I can read it out if you like. Okay, I can, I can see the chat now. So Scott said, Ian, why do scientists claim that the universe, the initial universe was flat and smooth? Would it be more reasonable to state the universe was a bit clumpy? Well, there's no evidence for the clumpiness other than the existence of galaxies. Wouldn't it be more likely if this clumpiness existed statistically rather than Yes, indeed. Well, it's both of those things. It um, was very clumpy. And this is, there's been a lot of effort to put into that in more recent years to show that in particular, the, the cosmic microwave background shows a certain non-uniformity 
which is quantitative both in the degree of uniformity and the spatial distribution of that. And that can be tied back to the predictions of the universe all the way to the inflation period. That's one of the reasons that they think inflation occurred because the clumpiness, in order to match the current clumpiness from the early quantum mechanics, you have to carry forward the structure of the universe very rapidly, to, which effectively carries up, allows information to spread throughout the universe. So the cosmic microwave background reflects the clumpiness, and, but that doesn't negate the flatness. That means something else altogether. Flatness means that on a very large scale, um, basically, my understanding of the flatness is that parallel lines would not converge. They would remain a given distance apart. Like if, you, if, if it was a spherical geometry with positive curvature and you were to construct two parallel lines on your sheet of paper and you projected them far enough, if we, if we lived on something like the surface of a sphere, in effect, they would converge and they'd eventually meet. On the other hand, if we lived in a hypersphere with negative curvature, they would diverge and get further apart. So the flat, flatness means that, and either of those cases suggests that the universe wouldn't be uniform. If you went far enough, it would look a little bit different. But the evidence indicates instead that it does appear uniform. And um, that ties in in a larger model with being flat. There are two, ex two equations called the Friedman equations that govern the evolution of the universe and there's a, a term which is its flatness, whether it's curved or not, and another term representing the growth in the size of the universe, the scale factor. And if you put all that in, you've got very few models that are self-consistent. And the best models for that indicate that it would have been flat. So that's my, that's my understanding of the flatness. It's a separate issue from the, the clumpiness. So Alan, Alan's got a question as well about Inflation, that's right. So you actually mentioned that, but I think it. Okay, yes, briefly, briefly my understanding of inflation um, is that the, um, that's necessary to provide the degree of uniformity that we see in the cosmic microwave background, as I said before. And where does it come from when we, when they talk about the Big Bang, they used to talk about the instant of the Big Bang, but these days that's not so clear. And it's understood that the universe comes from an ongoing inflation process. This was spelled out by Stephen Hawking and his collaborators. Uh, in fact, I think it was his last paper, Hawking's last paper published posthumously that described how the um, universe could ours could have arisen from the inflation process. So is the inflation once only? No, the um, under that theory, inflation is an ongoing process, always has been going on, always will be, but in a different sort of space time than ours. So we can't observe it. What we can observe is our own universe, and the inflation period. It's under this hypothesis is spawning new universes all the time, sprouting off new universes, some of which are smaller than a critical mass and collapse, collapse back into the quantum mechanical background, and some of which can be self-sustaining, like our own universe. And then, and they expand, they, they, the inflation process then becomes the Big Bang, which formed our own universe. So my, my understanding of the most popular current theory is that the inflation process is ongoing elsewhere in space and time and spawning off new universes all the time, one of which is ours. So there might, I think that we have other experts here tonight who might be able to be more accurate, but that's, that's my understanding. Okay. Okay, so you've got another question about dark, dark energy and dark matter from, um, from John Lee. Okay, thanks, yes. So dark matter I described in some detail is apparently invisible matter which coincides with the center of galaxies more or less. But being 
having greater total mass than the visible matter in a galaxy. It's as if dark matter governed the formation of galaxies. So what governed the formation of dark matter? It could just be the fluctuations we mentioned before being pulled together by gravity. So strangely enough, we know quite a lot about dark matter. We know its distribution in space pretty well. We know the speed it goes at because the we know it doesn't interact with itself. We know that it doesn't interact with ordinary matter. It doesn't have charge. It doesn't have the other properties which elementary particles have. What it does have, however, is mass. And that might be the only thing that it's got at the moment. Does it interact with other matter? If it is interacting at the moment, it's at such a low rate, it hasn't yet been detected. Although there are several experiments such as at I think it's at sale in Victoria, where they're using a mine to investigate that. And um, we know quite a lot about dark matter, in particular its distribution and how fast it's going, the particles, whatever they are, whether they're elementary particles are created in the Big Bang, or whether they're other larger particles, wimps or machos, which are invisible for other reasons. Dark matter, dark energy, on the other hand, is is different and dark energy might be no more than a constant. When Einstein formulated his field equations, he firstly had a constant in there called lambda, the cosmological constant, which was consistent with the mathematics. He didn't know whether it was zero or not. Later on, he called it his biggest mistake was to including this constant because he then assumed it was zero. But since then, after Brian Schmidt and others, um, showed that the acceleration of the universe is the expansion of the universe accelerating that indicated that in fact suggested there is dark energy there which has a repulsive force and is causing the expansion to accelerate so Einstein isn't around today but perhaps a few people would be telling him he was too hasty in assigning zero to his cosmological constant but whether it represents a real energy, perhaps a field that hasn't been studied yet, or perhaps even an inflation field. There are lots of fields conjecture that haven't been found. Could be that field, or it could simply be a cosmological, no more than a constant. Since its, it's property on the universe seems to be reflected in a single number, it could that suggest it's a simple entity rather than a complex entity. So that's my understanding of dark energy. So dark energy um, could be just a constant of nature and dark matter is much more known about that. Maybe. Higgs boson, well, the reason the Higgs boson was important because it showed the, suggested confirming the existence of the Higgs field. And the Higgs field is one of these, um, fields that I mentioned, there's the, possibly the inflation field and other fields which govern the universe and uh, don't, we don't know much about them. Usually a field implies the existence of particles, but the particles would be so energetic. That's why the Large Hadron Collider needed to find, needed very high energies to find the existence of the Higgs boson. So that was the important there, I understand. I've got another talk on that topic. Okay. Lou's got a question about, um, or rather a statement actually. <laughs> it's quite, quite good. Well, I actually have a question if you don't mind asking too about gravity. I, I mean, know. gravity is um, a, a, a very difficult concept. Does anybody understand that? Do you have any, do you know of any theories that are sort of verging on maybe, maybe understanding what it is? And I remember hearing a talk, a public talk by, um, Tamara Davies um, talking about clumping, how it happened in the, the early universe. It's to do with, it, actually the Big Bang, the reson, resonance of sound with the Big Bang causing clumping. Do you know any about that? Or can you sort of, you know, any theories about gravity in the stage? Thank you. Oh, well, I've used it. The second, my first career was in electromagnetics and for communications. And the second one was in gravity, aerospace engineering. So. I know a bit about using gravity and overcoming gravity. My talks on rocket science talk about vehicles that, that 
the job the job of most aircraft and rockets is to defy gravity however to, to do that newtonian gravity is quite sufficient which is quite straightforward and as i said when einstein came along uh, it all became much more complicated i do have a talk on relativity which is called relativity revealed um, which puts in popular terms much much of the findings of einstein mm -hmm. Just suddenly it popped into existence, you know, and it's affected. We know it's effects, but what, how, where? It's, anyway, to be dis to mm. be discovered. <laughs> okay, do we have other questions online or in person? Oh, actually, Anne's posted your link in the in the chat, which is good. Yeah. Okay. I'll. So, I better get onto that. Just. The oh, actually, you're, talking, you're not sure if the talk's actually there, even though you're advertised it. <laughs> okay. Wait, I've, I've got a, a question for, for Ian again. Yep. Um, Ian, when we talk about um, elementary particles below the proton, neutron, and electron, I th think philosophically we assign some, um, some, some mass or some matter to those particles. But when we get to the subatomic particles and start to talk about muons and bosons and quarks, are they matter in a physical sense or are they conceptual does that question make sense well it's believed they're well they're they're particles in most senses but the things one thing about them they do, like a proton or an electron can exist on its own you can yes in my old tv it used to fire electrons out of the gun and the electron would travel from A to B and take X microseconds to get there and, yep. and would liberate a photon from the surface mm -hmm. and made a red, make a red dot on my screen. That's right. So the electron and the proton are real particles and if, if they were fast enough, you could feel them because they could make a hole in your hand. Mm -hmm. But um, gluons, no, the gluon is a, I understand is a force particle between two quarks okay so that's the gluon can't exist on its own it's a means of carrying the force the um in fact the quantum chromodynamics force as as uh, described by richard Feynman, between two quarks so force particles are a bit different so if it grab it like photons are different from a, a less matter than than matter and um, force particles seem have a different sort of existence in my understanding of the standard model. And um, what else was I going to say? The, the quarks themselves, the quarks have been assigned energies, but that's partly based on theory, I understand, because you can't find an isolated quark. A proton can exist on its own, an electron can, but a quark can't. Quarks have to come in twos and threes. There's mesons and protons and neutrons and other particles made of groups of quarks. And the um, quarks have to come in twos and threes. They have fractional charges, you know, like a third and minus a third. And no, no particle has been located on its own with a fractional charge. They're all whole charges so does a quark exist on its own not but it can interact on its own in the sense in, in, of being part of a larger system one quark can interact with something else but it can't exist on its own is my understanding so they're less they're more fundamental in that they're a lower level than protons and neutrons but they're less material in the sense that they can't exist in on their own. That's my understanding. I put the link to the slides on the chat, by the way. Thank you. And the, there are it's also updated versions of the slides there too. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask another one? I've just, I noticed, um, I think that comets um, you described, they're made of iron and dust. The tails are made of iron and dust. Iron, that's curious. What do you what theories about why iron? I think iron is the last element that's made when a star is using up its, its fuel. I, 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 on, I, on. 
Oh, is it? Oh, I see. Okay. Iron. Sorry, yes, yeah, not the metal iron. Iron. Okay, good. good. Yeah. No, the okay the the, yeah. the tail of the comet. The comet has two tails. One is ions, I O N S, which is charged particles, mm -hmm. um, driven out from the comet by the heat of the sun and following magnetic fields, whereas the dust is is just particles, uncharged particles driven out by the sun, and forming a tail which is pressed, its direction is determined by the solar wind. So you've got two tails of different natures coming out of the comet. So the core of the comet would be ice and dust and rock, but I don't think metal. The metals are much more common in asteroids where you can have some magnetic asteroids which are nearly all iron, which is quite amazing. In fact, you can walk around the outback with a magnet on a stick and find fragments of, of fallen asteroids, fallen as meteorites, if I understand, using nothing more than a magnet. It suggests exploding stars, doesn't it? Because like I say, it's the last element that's made after all the I mean, collapses, fuels collapse, isn't it? So. Mm -hmm. So this take one more if there's any otherwise we might thank Ian very much actually just one more thing we have globular clusters surrounding our um in there too um could you like to comment something about globular clusters at all is that relevant or? well I, my understanding is that a globular cluster is just a group of stars in one locality so presumably they're gravitationally bound together but they're much smaller than a galaxy which the galaxy can contain a uh, hundred can oh, sorry, contain but you're, billion. No, I'm, I'm confusion we're talking about globular clusters around that milky way i'm thinking they're yeah, not so sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> so a globular cluster things like the jewel box in the sky how many stars does it have it might be 10 or 100 i'm not sure someone else might be able to illuminate us here a bit about globular clusters It's not a bad description of what you've done Ian, in terms of what it is. Yeah, it's not obviously a galaxy, but it's something smaller. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff Wheeler had a question, Wayne. Oh, thank oh, you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, it, it, in amongst uh, the, the laws of physics is a statement that matter can neither be created nor destroyed within a closed system. What actual parts of physics does that apply to? And is that actually true or have I misquoted the law? Okay, well, matter not being created or destroyed, conservation of matter, that's, uh, I think that's a simplistic view because um, there are so many different kinds of matter and with elementary particles and particle accelerators and dark energy and dark matter, there are other versions of matter which can carry material into or out of the system. But these days, scientists don't talk about conservation of matter. They talk about conservation of energy at a more fundamental level, which is nearly the same thing. Right. But um, so conservation of energy recognizes that what's being con conserved consists of matter particles. It's very familiar with the matter particles and plus anything that has energy, including ele all the elementary particles must have some energy and photons in particular. So um, that, and also forces, there can be many sorts of energy. One is gravitational energy. If the, if you were to take the earth and the moon and tear them apart, you would have to put in energy to pull them apart. And that energy has attractive force in the same way as of, in the same way of matter. So matter and energy become indistinguishable uh, at the under relativity. That was Einstein's one of Einstein's discovery was in his. Um, so Einstein named the mass energy tensor, which is a four by four array of properties which describe he hoped all the sources of energy or mass in the universe. And they include such things as ordinary matter, which we know of mass, 
or material with a given density. They include the energy of electromagnetic fields. Uh, it includes stress. If you've got a material in my relativity <coughs> talk, I get a block of foam and I compress the foam and there's stress inside the foam and that contributes several terms to Einstein's stress energy tensor. And the other one is pressure in a balloon. I even have a balloon. So if I compress this balloon, I'm increasing the energy due to the increased pressure. So, and another one is momentum flux. So that if you've got water flowing in a stream, that's carrying momentum, it's mass flow times velocity. That also contributes to the stress energy tensor. And by the time you combine all these together, you've got 16 terms, all of which can contribute to the so-called energy in a given location. And why does it add up to exactly 16? Well, it's not clear. There have been experiments to find out whether there are some missing terms in it, but at the moment it stood up rather well. And Einstein's special relativity, it has the advantage that it's self-consistent. If you work out Einstein's equations in a given reference frame, say the Earth, and then you, you write down all the properties of, of the matter and the forces and the motion, and then you transform that to a different reference frame, let's suppose one zipping through the solar system uh, attached to a, a spacecraft, all the velocities are different, hence the energies are different, even the masses are different because of the, the mass depends on the energy. And there's not too many stress energy tensors that you can come up with that survive that transformation that becomes self-consistent under the transformation. And that's that's was perhaps what gave Einstein greatest confidence in his equations was the fact that his stress energy tensor and other properties became um, invariant. The laws were the same despite relative motion. So there's that internal consistency, which is very important. Any other set of properties would likely have been shown to be inconsistent. So, and that was what gave Einstein his greatest confidence in, in his field equations. And it, it wasn't until much later that verifications came forward of its truth. For example, there was the um, rotation of the orbit of Mercury, Mercury. There was the bending of starlight near the sun. There's the rotation of spinning objects in satellites in orbits around the Earth. Uh, there are many, there's the redshift. There are many more recent observations which have confirmed the consistency of Newton's equations. So that's, so when we talk about the conservation of energy, we have to broaden it to include all of those things, which is basically that it becomes, it now boils down to Einstein's stress energy tensor. I was thinking more simplistic along the lines of that uh, matter can only be once it gets down to its destroyed enough down to its basic atoms that it can't go any further than that. And the same thing in reverse that you can't create matter out of nothing because there's no such thing as nothing. I think that's basically true. But you can, if you've got two photons, they can combine to if they've got some energy they can combine to create a matter particle or if you've got an electron and an anti-electron they can and they pass by each other they've got a given probability of interacting to release a pair of photons right so certainly particles and photons can in fact there, there are many different types of elementary particle which can combine with other ones to to interact so as i said the the uh, conservation of matter or conservation of energy has to be more broadly phrased these days. Okay. Right. Thanks. Okay. I think we might have just done for the questions then. I'd like us all to thank Ian. It was very, very thought provoking talk. And we, there's a lot of things he's covered tonight when this is very good. And I think everyone's learned something. So. <laughs>
I can say. Thank you very much, Anne, for for enlightenment yeah. and it's trying to. I, it's a, I understand you have had to cut some slides out because it's such a big talk. But uh, mm -hmm. for those people who've got the link now, we can have a look at everything. Mm -hmm. it's excellent. Thank you very Terrific, much. Terrific, Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for all the thanks for all the good questions too. Some pretty searching ones there. You don't, you've done, done well, eh? And because my 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 trial audience here as well. Some of you might not have met Annika since we haven't been meeting face to face, but since we get back to face to face. Well, hopefully later on in the year we'll be able to do that, but we still haven't got any word on that, I'm afraid we'll have to chase that up again. Okay, so thank you very much tonight, Ian. Um, that's the, if you're able to just stop the sharing for a second, I wanted to um, uh, do, do some other, thank you, that's great. I've got some other videos we might want to cover it up and um, you're quite welcome to stay on if you need to. It depends on how you're going. I've got a couple of videos for um, Starliner and also and Artemis and things like that. But if anybody wants to hang around for about another 20 minutes, we'll probably go through that. So I will just prepare that now. Does anybody else has got any other announcements? All right. Okay. Yep. So not